and there there is there is some good uh, cash or money as well so you make money <laughs> uh, so you'll be sure that you'll be able to make some good money too in in the little form that it comes even in our own sub region yeah Good evening, sir. Yeah, good evening and thank you. How are you doing today? I'm guy, I'm fine. I'm I'm okay. Are you ready for your 50 questions? Yeah, certainly I should and hopefully I'll be able to go through them <laughs> in the time uh, permissible for me. Alright, sir. So can you kindly introduce yourself? Okay. I am Stanley Oji Kalu. Uh, a medical practitioner, a resident in surgery, in residency training in surgery, uh, sub specialty neurosurgery. Where are you originally from? Country, state? Okay, I'm from Abia State in the southeastern part of Nigeria, uh, West Africa. Alright. Where did you do your undergraduate training? Okay, I did my undergraduate medical training at the University of Port Harcourt. And what specialty did you think you would go into right from medical school? Okay, uh, actually as a medical student, I had uh, hoped to be a physician uh, to go into cardiology. But in the later part of my training, I actually now intended to do cardiothoracic surgery. Until over time, I now found love rather for neurosurgery. <laughs> That's that. Are there any specialties you said not for me from the onset? Uh, certainly. Yeah, certainly they are. Uh, and the first of them is public health. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I never saw myself doing public health. I think I, I, I enjoyed clinical medicine. And so public health was first of them. Then afterwards, even the clinical medicine, I think I would not have wanted to do anything in pathology. And then maybe the other one is pediatrics. If not, any other one is good to go. <laughs> so how long does the training take in the West African Palace to become a new surgeon after medical school? Okay, uh, because of the peculiarity of the nature of our training, uh, we have a six to eight years period of training. Uh, however, for neurosurgery, is uh, a minimum of seven years, where there is a first three years that is considered your general training in surgery, where you are taught the principles and the uh, guides uh, principles and practice of surgery in general then you now have a minimum of four years for neurosurgery so that first three years plus this four it's seven years and that is our own curriculum in west africa in training neurosurgeons it's a minimum actually because it could get a bit longer sometimes is your specialty competitive and why yeah it's it's competitive uh, because the the number of persons there are fewer then secondly the demand uh, both knowledge uh, physical strength as well as uh, uh, other expectations in the training makes it competitive because there are a number of persons who would have wanted to but they are unable to put up with the demand and so they are unable to go into neurosurgery it's actually a competitive one even in the practice of neurosurgery itself you will find yourself in the midst of those as competition to keep your head afloat in practicing the specialty. Now we know that after residency training sometimes people desire to sub-specialize, maybe pediatric um, neurosurgery and all of that. Do you desire to sub-specialize? Yeah, I do truly uh, because uh, in our own nature of training in in the West African sub-region and for Nigeria, uh, you go into neurosurgery doing all the whole armamentarium of the subspecialty, pediatric neurosurgery, oncology, trauma, as well as the uh, other areas of neurosurgery, vascular, neurovascular neurosurgery. So I intend to go into neurotrauma and uh, uh, most probably add a neurovascular neurosurgery subspecialty to neurosurgery in order to fine tune uh, my skills as well as knowledge in neurovascular and trauma. What makes your specialty so unique? Perhaps one or two things that make it stand out. Okay, I, I think the uniqueness of neurosurgery <clears throat> is the fact that it's, it takes care of a part of the human body that drives every other human body, every other system. 
and so uh, the fact that you will be dealing with a tissue that if it uh, if it dies it becomes a catastrophe to the entire body system makes it unique then uh, for me the drive also in the uniqueness is the outcome sometimes people who seemingly have been uh, declared dead or unfit to live by their relatives by the time neurosurgery gives some intervention uh, they become fit again and so it makes it like revising, uh, reversing death to life uh, even though people don't seem to acknowledge this most times because of some other negative outcomes they have seen yeah why should someone choose your specialty yeah number one is i i would encourage one to do so uh, because there are fewer of us especially for our own sub-region in west africa uh, we need more persons imagine dealing with less than 200 uh, neurosurgeons for over 200 million population in nigeria in particular why a number of countries do not so it's a specialty we we lure encourage persuade people to come into then there, there's there's some good uh, cash or money as well so you make money <laughs> uh, so you'll be sure that you'll be able to make some good money too in in the little form that it comes even in our own sub-region yeah then why should someone not choose your specialty yeah why should someone is like telling me to say why somebody should not be uh, a doctor when i'm already a doctor <laughs> okay i think uh, part of why you should not is if you are not going to withstand the stress don't choose neurosurgery if you think you will not be able to stand the demand both academic as well as uh, social physical emotional and psychological demand don't even come uh, because it will take so much from you and so if you do not weigh your bargain well uh, don't be bother starting are there any stereotypes of your specialty people just put them in the box maybe neurosurgeons are <laughs> proud are too shy and calm are there things that people have yeah those stereotypes i even put to our face when we interact with people they say neurosurgeons they are very proud people they don't mind them they, they always feel they know everything uh, it's it's always uh, being said uh, but the truth is when you come close to one you find that they are there we aren't as bad as we are portrayed so there are those stereotypes that neurosurgeons are proud neurosurgeons never believe there is a rest neurosurgeons never think that there is a a break uh, those stereotypes exist by even fellow surgeons but in other specialty so they do exist what's your daily routine like as a neurosurgeon in training okay uh, my routine uh, is part of the stereotypes too uh, in that it involves uh, getting to do early morning chores as early as you can and then you are up for the ward rounds which is every day irrespective of public holidays or weekends and so ward rounds holds to see the patients every day after which for the days that clinics or theater sessions holds uh, those becomes the next activity after a quick ward rounds in the morning then after which a academic seminar holds and then back to ward rounds again for the p for the evening and so is that sequence of a break that comes in between for uh, maybe take some break to ease off stress and come back so it's a routine of just minor chores, clinical work, minor chores, clinical work. And for us in, in religious faith, you just take some few moments and attend to your religious faith as well. Mm. What's the reading between clinic and surgeries? Your clinical interactions with patients are they more, more tedious or the surgical procedures are more? I think uh, both are tedious because you would have to deal with a large number of patients who you will interact with during your routine ward rounds uh, then the surgeries as well in fact sometimes the surgeries sometimes don't get too long because there are a number of procedures that don't take so long a time uh, but uh, there are others that actually take quite a long time to to finish so both are tedious but i think uh, sometimes the surgery parts may be more tedious because you'll be required to do a lot of standing and a lot of uh, uh, energy in putting up some uh, procedures to be done so, sir, we forgive about our choice of word here, but what's the craziest case you've ever been a part of? Mm. Yeah, it, it's, it's actually a case for a skull based tumor. And we were at, in tra uh, trying to take out the tumor. And we went into a very, very, very torrential bleed from a very major vessel. 
uh, sadly we lost the patients on table yeah so it was crazy in fact that was my early phase in my early phase of my training and i almost had intended changing my mind because <laughs> i couldn't imagine how bleed would have been that torrential and very scary so potential neurosurgeons listen <laughs> yeah they, they do continue. yeah you have to okay. how often do you get to work with medical students ah, very regular in fact the, our interaction cuts across both medical students nursing students uh, post-basic nursing, post-graduate uh, students like those in other specialties. So we have uh, regular interactions with medical students during their rotation, through the surgery posting and neurosurgery in particular. And so we do academic seminars and they see what we do. We put them through the basics they need to know uh, as it pertains to their level of knowledge. How many patients do you see on average in a day? Mm. On the average in a day, should we say seven to ten on the average seven to ten yeah. but some days you will see as far as 20 something wow. yeah on the average is seven to ten of them how many hours do you work on average in a week hmm. truly that would be uh, not too clear to me because there's no break <laughs> why i say so it's uh, if you are on call uh, the nature of our calls for our own units is such that you're on a straight week call and so I can't say I, I is like 24 times 7. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually a very long one. But on the average, even when you are not called, you'll be doing a minimum of 70 to 90 hours in a week. Because I'm looking at doing an 8 to 5, 8 to 6 a day, and then also doing weekend rounds, even when you are not called. So it's that, that lengthy. What time do you have to wake up daily? Mm. For the days that are very specific for things to do it has to be as early as 5 a.m other days it could be no sleep at all and so you just get a nap and continue by 3 a.m again for posts up review but other good days that you don't have any pending cases <laughs> maybe 6 a.m so it's about 5 6 a.m daily what time do you finish work for the day time to finish work for the day well, neurosurgery on the average, it should be uh, between 3 to 5 p.m. Yeah, between 3 to 5 p.m. Because sometimes when you are through with rounds, a few other uh, post-round issues are sorted out. So by 3 p.m., if you are not call, you should be done. A few other times, you may stretch to 5 p.m. How many hours of sleep do you get mm. on average? Mm. Uh, for me, yours sincerely has sought to always get a good sleep, uh, even if it's not a stretch, but at least five to seven hours, I have always tried to do so. Yeah, except if I'm operating over the night. Uh, if not, a minimum of five to seven hours is what I do. Some people may do less hours. I don't know how they do it. <laughs> Other people, or doing longer means you may not have some things to do in the morning. Mm. Private practice or an academic and clinical setting makes practice more difficult. What's your pick? Certainly, I would always go for a clinical academic practice because it's been my favorite uh, thing that involves academia and clinical. Mm, not really a flair of private practice, maybe just once in a while. What's the most rewarding part of your field? Yeah, in fact, that is the exciting part of neurosurgery, where you have those patients who come with uh, almost vegetative, or the lay people call them dead unconscious from a tumor or a hematoma blood in their brain. And when you evacuate or you operate them, they become fully conscious and interact with relatives. Uh, it's very common with chronic subdural hematoma. They're very rewarding. You, you, so they will see you as a god. <laughs> What's your favorite thing to do when you're not working? Hmm. When I'm not working, I actually do more surfing the net and then I do sports. Yeah, table tennis and a few times football. <laughs> yeah, those are my non-clinical practice. <laughs> Who is the most famous neurosurgeon that I've ever lived? Ah, uh, we've all been used to Ben Carson. <laughs> uh, even though he, in the, in the history of neurosurgery, is actually have a cushion wow. that is the most famous neurosurgeon. But in our time, and even me as a young medical student, uh, Ben Carson was the most uh, admired neurosurgeon. We always wanted to be like. Mm. 
What's your method of relaxation in the midst of the stress? Like I said, I get distracted by maybe surfing the net. Then other times, time out with family and friends. Uh, also my leisures. What's the range of financial remuneration for neurosurgeons globally and also within uh, sub-region? Hmm. In, 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 in dollars, <laughs> I, I wouldn't be sure of what they belong to, but I think it's something, something rewarding. Uh, in in for us in the sub African West African sub region, it's something rewarding. And then I know globally it's actually amongst the top rated remunerated. But I'm not sure of a value I want to give you now. Is it financially rewarding, equivalent to the stress it comes? With? If you ask me, I'll say yes. When you when you get some some financial implication of some neurosurgical procedure, uh, some you get encouraged that the stress was worth it uh, but much more is the outcome of what the patient become not really how much you get and or you uh, you take home at the end if not neurosurgery what else for you in surgical specialty or in medicine or in life <laughs> in life i actually had always wanted to be an engineer wow. and so if i had not done medicine certainly i would have gone for engineering yeah, i i would i had flair for it actually if you could change one thing about the medical practice now, what would it be? I think the, for us in this part of the world, I think the work pattern should be changed. There should be a review of how we do the work so that it doesn't give so much burden on an individual or group of few people. And I think that is the work pattern. The, the work strategy should be changed to allow for lesser burden on the few doctors and health workers available. What would you say to the aspiring neurosurgeon right now? It is doable, it is rewarding, and you will be glad you did if you come. <laughs> but prepare for the worst, but hope for the best. <laughs> What's the one personality trait that can help someone survive in neurosurgery? Being positive-minded, being uh, see the good side of it. And don't be dissuaded by the bad side or the negative both perception and outcomes you see uh, remain positive uh, it's a good drive to go through it how has training to be a neurosurgeon changed you uh, truly it has changed me over because i i think sometimes i look at some things i had told myself i would do when i leave the university and neurosurgery have taken my whole life and time that i could barely do them so I think it has modified a bit, but I think there are a number of things I still could do. Uh, like I have flair also for missions, uh, for outreaches for the less privileged. I have not really been doing them the way I could because of neurosurgery. But I think it's, uh, it's still doable and I still do the ones I can. What are the top five factors generally now anyone should consider in choosing a specialty? One is the the joy you get when you do it, you should find satisfaction in doing it. Then two is the, the stress level, if it's a tolerable stress level, consider that before doing so. Uh, three is, is this for us here, is a specialty that will not involve you uh, doing uh, very awkward things in order to survive. Go for specialty that will keep you within the terrain of professionalism. And consider the fact of the fund, the finance you get, it's very important <clears throat> so that you'll be self-sustainable or self-sufficient when you have uh, gone through the training. Uh, then God should always be a factor in all this. God should always be a factor. Mm. Is there any challenge you face that you want to share and how you overcame it? Yeah, the part of my challenge in neurosurgery through the, is at a point I was getting uh, distrust with the stress level that I even had to start contemplating ah, am I having an anxiety or something and so I was able to remind myself that you have come this far uh, through medical school you was there you were able to overcome so through postgraduate training and specialty you should be able to and then uh, the discouraging part will come from both your trainers as well as colleagues as well as patients so at one point I just tell myself no you love doing this uh, just ignore all those and keep doing it and get the joy that you are doing what you love doing 
and so I was able to overcome them. <laughs> and finally, what is your advice to the aspiring medical doctor out there? Yeah, the aspiring medical doctor out there should come. The, the field is large. The harvest is bountiful. Uh, we, we want uh, the Lord of Harvest to send more people. And so come and put your hand to the plow. Don't look back. It's doable. You'll be able to achieve your dreams, your aspirations, and be who you want to be. It's, it's worth doing. And, and we encourage as many as to do so. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. We are very delighted to uh, have you on the channel. And we hope to see you again some years down the line and perhaps ask how it's going and also you share more from the world of experience. Yeah, that thank you. Awesome. It's been my pleasure. And thank you for having me on your channel. God bless you. Amen. Thanks, sir. <laughs>